but uh, decision-making processes. That's quite an interesting aspect, and that is uh, where I wanted to go into AI, because it is a decision-making process that we want to uh, generate. And now, uh, what can we learn out of uh, biology? Okay, we had already two talks about it, and now I'm going to focus even more into very small minutial details with a very small animal, one millimeter in size, and only 300 neurons, uh, 302 to be exact, on the hermaphrodite. We'll come to it. So um, the first thing that I wanted to ask you is how many of you are aware of the work from Ramon and Carajal? Yeah, <laughs> that's great. So these are neurons, right? Uh, or how we see them. And we saw it also in Moritz's talk. So we know, neurons, great. Uh, next part, how many uh, know how uh, neurons work? So action potentials and on the muscles we do know, right? The muscle activation and so. But uh, are you aware of this? stochastic activation, where single synaptic vesicles fill in, and we have a little bit of information flow that we don't know why it is there. So, is that aware? No. Yes! <laughs> thank you, Tim. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you very much. Okay, a background to myself. Uh, I work with chemical synapses. Uh, the pointer doesn't work that well, but... Um, Chemical synapses, in a sense, have our, our neurotransmitters that we use, for instance, acetylcholine or GABA, right? And uh, there is also modulatory vesicles uh, for dopamine, serotonin, uh, things that, that we hear. Uh, chemical synapses is one of the types. There are other types of synapses. And uh, what I worked with for 10 years now is uh, optogenetics. So I'm using proteins that are modulated by light to control how the neuron behaves. So if you wish, you could depolarize the neuron, and then you have the neuron activated, right? Um, if you would do that to all my motor neurons, what would happen? We know that it's something called tetanus. Get tetanic, and that's it, okay? That's not good. So we want uh, other methods of modulating how neurons work. And uh, the easiest organism to apply these is on C. elegans. C. elegans is the small worm here. Uh, one millimeter complete, this is the head with a mouth of it. There are some eggs that you can see down there. It's transparent, genetically tractable, so we know the genome. It's easy to genetically modify those. Um, and it's um, always with 302 neurons. All cells are always in the same position. So it is easy to check between animals uh, what is the effect that you're generating. So um, one of the things that I performed in the lab was to apply a new optogenetic tool into it. And uh, here you can see the neurons tagged. I could tell you these are all the neurons. Um, the head is there. This is the feeding organ that I said, the, the mouth, so to say. And uh, here are the neurons, and you can see here um, nerve ring. If you want to talk about a brain for, the neuron, for this animal, then it would be there. It's a nerve ring. Uh, where most of the connections are. There are 7,000 synapses in there. So about the same number of connections that seven neurons in our brain do, right? <laughs> that we picked from the other talk. Um, then, if we now activate these optogenetically, why isn't it? Oh, come on, it did work before. Could you press, please, on a movie? That's a movie. No, that doesn't work. Uh, so, um, if, um, if you would see what uh, this movie is playing, that it was playing before, uh, what you would see is upon uh, photo activation, the animal is uh, swimming around, and one of the questions was, can we make these connections faster in the last talk, right? Well, not substantially faster, but about 30% faster. So we can improve how fast the neurons are working, and the animal will move faster, and it will swim faster in there. Um, it comes with a little hint, and that is it will be more susceptible to noise. So the animal will do more errors while it is performing its movement. And uh, we went into it to see what, what are the effects actually in the ultrastructure of the neurons. And if you now see one single synapse and cut it in half and look at these, uh, what you would see is something like that. These are 200 nanometers here at this bar. So it's, it's really small. And uh, you can observe that there are many synaptic vesicles. These are the ones that carry the transmitters that we use. Um, you also see a blue one here. This is a modulator, so a dense core vesicle carrying modulators. 
And you see the red ones in here. These are the ones that are ready to deploy and send the information through. Okay. So what we observed is that uh, when, we, when we make the animal faster, synaptic vesicle release, so these green ones, they dock preferentially, and then we have higher transmission of these synaptic vesicles. But we also induce modulation by releasing these bluish there, the, the ones with the dark content, the modulators. And a further one, and that was quite surprisingly, the size of these ones were increased. So if you pick a synaptic vesicle, we would say, that, well, there is a content in it. And uh, if we now increase the size, it is because it's swelling, because the content is increased. So the modulation of the neuron works by changing the quantal size of information inside of a single synaptic vesicle, and that for all. So long story short, what it happened through this optogenetic activation there was that we increased the probability of release, and then by a second method, we also increased the information content in this single synaptic vesicle. Okay? So that is, that is interesting because we can modulate how the activity of uh, the neurons will be over time. And uh, now we come to these modulators and the connectivity that we talked about. So if we now look at the connectome of uh, C. elegans, so all the connections that the animal does, the green one in here, these are all synaptic connections and chemical synaptic connections. This one in here, in dark gray, quite different to see, is uh, the one for the electrical synapses, the ones that we see in the electron microgram. But the ones from um, dopamine and serotonin we have in here, there are different connections that go across and they modulate everything. And now we have these uh, bluish uh, dense core vesicles that I showed you with neuropeptides, and they have a completely different um, pathway and another network that they generate. We disentangled about 10% of the neuropeptidergic connectome in C. elegans. And what you're seeing here is just a few of those. It's not fully 10%. We're talking about over 100 different neuropeptides and over 1,000 different receptors. They're all intermingled. So the connectome itself is also very, very specific in there. And modulation happens in a very interesting way. So for instance, this is one of the neurons, RIS. It's a very small, and this should rotate so that you can see better, but this is the nerve ring. As you can see, this is the cell body of the animal, uh, of the, the neuron, sorry. And uh, this one is a small branch uh, characteristic for this neuron. And it is in the head of the animal in here. Okay. When, uh, please work, no. <laughs> well, if this uh, movie would be running, what you would see is that the animal does not move. So when you, you photoactivate uh, this neuron and you depolarize it, what happens is that the animal does not move anymore. So it is moving around, you turn it on, animal stops, waits, 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 until it lights off, and then it will move again and continue moving. Yeah. And... Ah, it works! So this is... <laughs> The best video. Okay, so do you see how the colors change? And then, if, if the color changed, it is because this uh, neuron was active. Okay, and you can see that the neuron gets activated before it stops, and then it stops and uh, takes an action. So this is the decision making in the animal. This uh, this wrist neuron is there to make a decision: should I stop? Should I go? What is happening in here? Okay, so. It turns out that this, uh, this activation here, if we would see, this is the neuron, right? This is the cell body, this branch region, the uh, nerve ring that we talked about. We see an activation briefly before the animal does a reversal, right? This is the way that uh, we plotted it in there. Well, interestingly enough, if before to that there is a hyperpolarization, the neuron gets information from somewhere else, coming from the tail, then it knows, oh, there is some, something bad also behind me. I shouldn't move to there. I should better just wait and see what happens best, right? Uh, so this is, unfortunately, a neuron that is taking care of this small, well, it's actually very big, another um, 
worm that uh, predates on our poor C. elegans. This, this one being eaten up is unfortunately my C. elegans animal. And it wasn't happy about it, but what, what RIS is doing, this single neuron there, is picking up the information, is something bad ahead of me or behind me, and what should I do? Okay, and if things go south, it will wait and hope for the best. And in this case, it was trapped and it couldn't just uh, go away. But uh, this neuron is extremely specific for fleeing around, and that should happen as fast as you can do. This decision should be as specific as possible, right? And you better err, uh, make an error in the sense of, I flee one time more than uh, not. And this neuron is there doing exactly that in a very consistent and fast method. But it's doing another thing too, that in uh, us humans, or in, in all of the uh, mammalian animals, uh, it's divided into multiple different uh, neurons. And I hope that this movie works. And uh, this red dot in here is the cell body for us in long stimulation, all right? So the, it is active for a long period of time. And it does work, fantastic. And uh, what you see is that the, the neuron is active for a long time. And the animal is essentially sleeping. And if we now wake him up using uh, a pulse of oxygen, so the animal thinks oh, what's going on in there, it will respond quite fastly. And you can see the other neurons up, lighting up in a second. And now, animal is woken up and uh, is trying to move away or um, forward or backward, but it's restrained. That's why it can't move, so that we can film it. And, um, yeah, unfortunately. Well, uh, it did try a lot of things. It didn't manage to get away. And then we get the oxygen levels down again. And uh, what we see is that the wrist neuron goes up for a long period of time, and the animal sleeps again. Okay. So sleep is also important for other animals. It's not something that is exclusive for mammalian animals. And um, the, the point is, you need to be very fast if there are changes in environment. And in order to be fast when there are changes in the environment, you, you must secure that your uh, neural network is in a, in a cr criticality state. So system criticality is the way that a system can best react to outside information. Right? But the moment that it reacts to this outside information, it will, by definition, go away from the criticality state. And in order to maintain this criticality, you need another uh, another modulation of your network. And these are what we expect to be re required, or the requirement of uh, neuropeptides, for instance, or neuromodulators. They are probably there, or we think they are probably there, in order to maintain this criticality state so that the animal can react as fast as possible and as accurate as possible to external stimuli. It hasn't been proven yet for C. elegans, mainly because it is really hard to get information from neurons that are moving and changing their, um, the, uh, how they look like in, in the video, as you saw in the movie, where the um, size of the uh, neuron is also changing. But there are a few pointers that show that also the neuronal code in C. elegans is in a criticality state. Okay. And this could be one way of joining everything to maintain a fast and accurate representation of the world, and then also modulating your own activity to it. Right. So now going out from the single animal, and uh, going to something completely different, and this is uh, all the animals in a, in a population. So C. as I said, is a hermaphroditic animal. Uh, hermaphroditic animal means it lays its eggs fecunded by itself. So it doesn't need actually to copulate to uh, maintain its generations, right? But uh, there is an interesting aspect that when things go bad and the environment is harsh, then silicons will produce males. And these males, by mating, will produce different offspring. And the, the rate of change in the genome will be higher in silicons. So it's easier to adapt if things get really bad. Okay. But there is a way that uh, they found, or that the uh, salience has uh, a control on the population of males. And this is by, for instance, if the animal does not mate the, the male one, what that happens is that it can live up to seven days perfectly fine. And remember, this animal lives only for three days. It takes three days to go from egg to adult. So this male is capable of fecunding not only 
its own generation, the next generation, and the next generation there, thereafter, would still be possible to change information, genetic information. While mated animals, after three days, are almost dead and do not mate anymore. So it is a way of controlling that. And then there is a second way. If you have too many males, I don't have a video for that, excuse me, but uh, if you have too many males, these males will release uh, neuromodulators that make the younger males turn around in circles, change it, chasing their own tail, so this is a tail chase behavior, and by that they cannot mate. Okay? <laughs> yeah. So these animals can control also other animals in there that are a little bit younger than their, themselves if uh, things are required. And uh, then we think about, well, if, if the animals are always in this, have always the same near in the same position and all the cells are equal, uh, will the change only be in if we have a, a mating profile? No, that's unfortunately not like that easy. So, um, oh, doesn't work? Oh. Well, okay. Um, what you would see in here are two different, um, well, actually almost 100 animals. They are all from the same progeny, from the same mother haven't been mated, so they're pretty much genetically e uh, identical, but they behave extremely differently. So the red one would be running around all the time, while the blue one would be sitting down and mostly not moving at all. So the, the interesting part of it is, although they're genetically identical, and we know the connectome, and we know where all these 7,000 synapses are, they're not always there. So we have about 40% of the synapses are pretty much robust across animals. Half of it is not. And some animals do have these synapses, while others do not. And 10% of those are unique per animal. And we still don't know why they are unique in these animals and what makes them unique in there. So there is a variation in, in there by itself. So with that, um, what I wanted to convey is that in, uh, in neurobiology from last year's, we have a lot of new information that could be used in order to improve the AI systems that we are talking about in this conference and further. So things that we already apply are topology between neurons, right? So we call these artificial neural networks. But uh, also the topology inside of some neurons, for instance, in the HTM machines, are, uh, is presented. Um, but what we don't have is this compartmentalization that you saw, for instance, in this wrist neuron, where depending on where it is active, the behavior will be completely different. All right? uh, this is not specific for C. elegans. So for in, uh, well, insects, uh, there is a, a single neuron, an amacrine cell, um, that has almost 1,400 compartments that are unique to each other. Right? And uh, they do a completely different processing depending on the location of the cell. And this is possibly also the case for our own vision systems. So the neurons themselves, they are extremely compartmentalized. And we do have some algorithms that go into this exploration exploitation that the animals need to do in order to survive that are quite effective. But what we don't really have is a way of modulating activity depending on the size. So we could use a, a system like um, meta-reinforcement learning with an LSTM and behind it um, to model what would happen if the oxygen level would change, right? But if we do that, this RL part will be very, very slow, most likely. While in reality, these things are extremely fast. Right? You need to be extremely fast in order to resolve these problems. And uh, this is mainly because in uh, biological neurons, what we have is uh, very different pathways for um, information change. So we have very fast depolarizations through gap junctions, for instance, and then we have the chemical ones that are a little bit slower. And then we have the neuromodulators like dopamine and serotonin, which are even slower. And neuropeptides can take up to seconds to work perfectly fine in a, in a network. And with that, we end up having a system that possibly is working on a criticality environment. And that's a, that has been shown for AI, for instance, in the self-organized and recurrent neural networks. So it is a thing that we should keep in mind and, and think about it and train them also or use them. And um, one of the things that we don't really use is sleep. So sleep is a method that we think 
think it's used in neural networks, biological ones, to improve or the feedback and use that and create the, the memories that we see. So um, this is probably one thing that we could apply in order to um, improve our current methods nowadays. Group dynamics have been shown to work, for instance, in multi-agent systems, right? But the, uh, and reproduction and, and genetic algorithms, but they are all specific parts of it. We have tried to um, uh, join these, but the interesting part will be when all of these work together. And in the end, one thing that is really missing is uh, death, unfortunately. So we all speak about artificial intelligence, but not about when will it die. So I would plead that artificial intelligence should die in order to actually work out. Because if not, all of the effort that we are applying to create an artificial intelligence won't work exactly as, or won't be reliable enough. So I think that the, the moment where an artificial intelligence is capable of dying, it will be the point where we will truly achieve intelligence, because this is the motivator to maintain it. its life. And with that, I'd like to thank you all, and thank you for your appearance. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Wagner. Does anybody have a question? We've got 10 minutes for Q&A. Yeah. Please. Hi. Um, you spoke about neural peptide mm -hmm. uh, networks within the neural network. So um, I didn't know that existed before today. So uh, our artificial neural networks only uh, simulate the course overall neural network structure. Would you say that the information processing in the sub-networks of neural peptides is um, more important than the neurons in the overall larger neural structure or uh, as important? Or do you think we can get away with um, not simulating that? Or do you think we have to go deeper? So and I can speak to, to C. elegans what we saw in the neural peptides that we looked at. And, uh, you can do what neuropeptides are doing using chemical synapses, for instance. So the neuropeptides require this uh, long time for exposures, so from release to long time exposure. Um, neurotransmitters are usually uh, cleared much faster, so they can't maintain their activity for long periods of time. Um, neuropeptides have another effect too. So you can have a single neuropeptide that acts on multiple receptors. And these multiple receptors can have different concentrations to which they work. And by that, you can further modulate the effect of a single neuropeptide. And so in, in a sense, I don't think that it is possible to, um, to adapt these with the current methods. OK, who has another question? Come on, guys. I'm pretty sure that was like there are some open questions. Nice. Yeah? Girls as well. Mm. Thanks again for your presentation, uh, Jesse Lerke, Free University. Um, more of a request for elaboration than a actual question yeah. in that uh, you quickly went over the death aspect at the, at the end. Could you explain more about your actual logic about why you're in favor of death by default, simply because from my own, I'm generally not, but it's from a different disciplinary perspective. Yeah. Uh, um, so I'd be interested in your logic behind <laughs> your reasoning. Thank yeah. you. Um, so the... the why I think that uh, death by default is, is interesting is um, in an evolutionary sense that uh, if we are going to program the algorithm that is going to create AI, um, then uh, the AI itself will have multiple iterations of it. And uh, I think that if you allow now multi-agent AIs to um, cooperate or uh, to be competitive to each other, um, then death is a very good uh, benchmark to improve the efficiency of, a, of an AI, um, in a sense of how uh, in evolution uh, things worked out. I'm not saying that this is the only way, um, but it is one that worked out uh, quite well, at least in our planet, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, does anybody have a question? Okay, last row. Uh, hello. Uh, I was just wondering if you are associated with the Open Worm project at all. No, I'm uh, unfortunately not associated with those. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Are you? No, I was just wondering. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Found it interesting. So I, I talked to them and we met uh, multiple times, but I'm not associated with them. 
Okay, to anybody who's not into worms, what is the Open Worm uh, project? So the Open Worm project uh, tries to emulate uh, C. elegans in, uh, in silico. So uh, they have uh, generated uh, all the connections and all the properties of the neurons and the muscles in silico and try to, um, try to simulate how the animal will move in a certain environment considering uh, the restraints of the biology of the animal. 